So much stuff about airplanes in the news recently and so many of your questions and we're going to handle all of them today on this episode of Ask the Captain. Let's jump into question number one. It's from the Oldar. He writes, regardless of the maximum altitude, uh, is designing a helicopter route so close to a major airport final approach path simply madness? Uh, that's it's really close to madness. Uh, talking about DCA and the recent hearings that were held about the DCA crash with the Army helicopter and the uh, and the regional jet back in January uh, after 9/11. Uh, if you recall, Reagan National Airport was the last airport to reopen. It took months to reopen that airport because Congress was so scared and so frightened and so nervous that something might happen to them that they made radical changes at DCA and they made uh, approach and, and departure corridors so tight. Basically, think of it this way. They took an eight lane highway that used to be the approach into that airport down to a two lane country road. And then they just stacked everybody up on top of each other to get in and out. It was a problem waiting to happen. And so it did this past January. Uh, was it madness? Uh, I don't know. I think it was um, born out of fear is what it was. Uh, and it ended up having bad consequences. Great question. Next one is this snail, right? Having a helicopter route that goes right through an airliner's short final approach seems like an accident waiting to happen. Yep. Who is ultimately responsible for approving the flight route like that? Well, the FAA is ultimately responsible for it. But again, it was an interaction between Congress and what they wanted to have happen at DCA and what the FAA finally accommodated to get Reagan National reopened after September 11th. It's been a lot of years since 9-11. I'm not sure the concern or the fear is warranted, but the uh, arrival and departure corridors are still just as tight as they've ever been in there. Now, I understand that they have changed where the helicopters go, which is a good change. Um, they're in the process of modernizing and updating the system. It can't happen fast enough for me, but in order to make it happen and happen in a timely manner, our representatives need to hear from us. So remember, you've got the power. You can pick up the phone. You can send a text or an email. All your congressmen, call your senator uh, and say, I want uh, the air traffic control system to be updated and I want it to be done now. They will respond to you. All right, great question. At KAV4931, the report mentions 15,000 close calls from a pilot's perspective. Uh, how is it possible for a system to have so many warnings to remain in place without being changed? Well, that's a good question. It, it kind of defies common sense at times. Uh, there's a certain uh, criteria to call something a near miss. Uh, and sometimes close calls and near misses are two different things. I don't think there's nearly as many near misses as there were close calls. Uh, but a close call is a close call. And we don't want any of those ultimately. So is the system being changed? Yes. Is it going to change uh, overnight? No. Uh, is it going to change at all? It depends on whether you pick up that phone and call your congressman. All right. So keep up the pressure, my friends. You're in those airplanes as, as well as I am. And uh, we want to make sure that we've got the safest system. But put pressure on those folks. Make them do their jobs. All right. Next is at Aftermath 1738. As a private pilot, I find it concerning that the NTSB had over a thousand open recommendations for the FAA that went unanswered. That, that's, I do too, all right? Can you speak to the relationship between the NTSB's safety recommendations and the FAA's implementation of them? Okay, so um, Ted Cruz just proposed legislation called the Rotor Act, and that's a specific thing that you can call your congressman and your senator about, and you can say, I want you to pass the Rotor Act. Part of the Rotor Act is to uh, make sure that the NTSB or the FAA must implement NTSB recommendations. Up to this point, they don't have to. So the NTSB and the FAA who are separate, the NTSB makes a recommendation. I think you ought to change this, that, and the other thing. And the FAA can look at it and go, eh, nah, and they just don't. And so are special interests involved there? Absolutely. 
All right, big aviation gets involved and says, well, we don't want to do that. And they pressure, they've got lobbyists, they throw money at these people. And the only thing, well, one of the only two things that makes Washington, D.C. operate anymore is money from special interest. And the other is a phone call from you and me. But we got to do it collectively and get in there and say, pass the Rotor Act. I've read it. I like it. It's a great improvement and it'll force the FAA to implement NTSB recommendations. It's a good bit of legislation. All right. Next is uh, at Todd Corm. Uh, a retired ATC controller stated that the bottom line is that the routes are supposed to be designed to de-conflict, not conflict, and that if it didn't happen to this crew, it was going to happen to another. Do you agree that this is was a, a systematic failure waiting to happen, uh, regardless of the individual pilots involved? Yes, and I blame Congress. All right, let me be very clear about this. If there's any ambiguity in what you think is happening here, Captain Steve is blaming Congress. Congress was so cowardly and so scared back in 2001 that a 9-11 type of incident was going to come their way that they absolutely turned the DCA into a mess waiting to happen. And it took over 20 years, 20 plus years to happen, but it did. And they've got to undo what they did back then. The sad part is most of, but not all of those congressmen and senators are long gone. They've moved on. But the law and the then the uh, conflictions in and out of DCA remain. It's just mind numbing the whole thing. All right, we've got at uh, Bogue Hall, right? So why is the focus on blaming the altimeter instead of uh, questioning the decision to have a helicopter route that passes right off the approach end of the runway at a busy airport? uh in the first place okay the the altimeter setting thing is is a distraction it is part of what happened here uh it could be a significant part of what happened here but we should have routes that are so tight and so confined that a misplaced altimeter setting causes an accident where that many people die just shouldn't be uh we should fix the routes in and out of dca uh, and then take a look at our altimeter procedures for sure. We don't want to do one or the other. We want to do both. But yeah, you're right. That's that's a good, that's a well-placed concern. All right. Uh, at James Smartens 7273, is it true that these pilots were likely getting their readings from a radar, radar altimeter, which is more accurate at low altitudes and not the barometric altimeter being blamed for the error? Both come into play at low altitudes. The radio altimeter is there or the radar altimeter, sometimes it's called, is there uh, at low altitudes. It gives you the height above the ground and so forth. Uh, and uh, But most pilots are going to be looking primarily at their, their main uh, altimeter, the barometric altimeter at this point. My understanding was that they were conducting training and I think the pilot was on night vision glasses, which greatly confines your um, field of vision. Uh, even the altimeter setting, the instructor was the one that needs to be watching out for everything outside the airplane as a student uh, is doing that. One of the things about the Rotor Act that I just mentioned is it eliminates any training in Class B airspace, Class C, Class D, anywhere near uh, an airport. You've got to get away before you start your training. And that's a good, so the Rotor Act is, is a thumbs up for me. All right, at Herbie Smith 4 j writes, uh, if there was a problem with the helicopter altimeter, shouldn't the crew have caught it during their pre-flight checklist? How could such a critical step be missed? Well, there's human beings flying airplanes and they can miss anything. That's not really a pre-flight check. There wasn't anything wrong with the barometric reporting system on the airplane, the pedostatic system. There's nothing wrong with it. It would be an, an altimeter setting that was the wrong altimeter setting. Maybe it was too old and it's changed. Maybe they put the wrong one in by mistake. Any of those things can happen. Human beings can make errors, but you shouldn't have such tight um, arrival and, and uh, corridors that an uh, altimeter being off by 20 or 30 uh, points would, would cause a mid-air collision. That that just shouldn't be. All right, at Ron Ray, can you explain how night vision goggles affect a pilot's vision, specifically depth perception, and how the bright landing lights on an airliner might impact a pilot using them? Well, my understanding of night vision goggles is that they do confine your vision because you've got goggles on. So first of all, you've got this part of your peripheral vision is gone. You're looking through night vision goggles. 
they illuminate everything at night, but things that shouldn't be illuminated, like bright lights, you don't need illumination on those, get even brighter. And then there's the glare. If you've got any sort of astigmatism, it, it causes even more of those strings to kind of come out from whatever it is that you're looking at. And it can, it can hamper your field of vision. Was that a factor here? I think it absolutely was a factor here. Uh, and that's why the Rotor Act is saying, let's get rid of that stuff. We're not doing that when we're in in, in a tight space with other aircraft. Once you get out to your operating area and you're clear to, to maneuver, then you put your night vision goggles on. That would make sense. All right, uh, Bunker Rocket Works 3190. Why are pilots wearing night vision goggles allowed to fly near the final approach path for commercial uh, aircraft? And what are the risks involved with night vision goggles use in the high uh, traffic brightly lit area. I think I just answered that question. I would say call your congressman and your senator and say, let's pass the Rotor Act, right? That's going to eliminate or make it illegal for um, training with night vision goggles in those types of areas. But that's a good question. Uh, at Tech's Place, why doesn't the military require TCAS traffic collision avoidance system on all of its aircraft, especially those that operate near civilian aircraft? That's a great question. Um, uh, there's been some arguments over the years that because of the special missions that military aircraft do, that this would be a thing that would let them you know, be seen. Well, you're not doing a special mission over DCA airport. I can just tell you that. OK, so they can install these systems and you can train your pilots to know when to turn them on and when to turn them off. And so I, I think the Rotor Act requires TCAS and ADS be in and out on every military aircraft regardless. So again, this is not a commercial for the Rotor Act, but now you know more about the Rotor Act than you probably wanted to. Call your congressman and your senator and let them know. All right, next is at Papa Tango 2362. Why should the military be allowed to communicate with civilian uh, ATC on UHF, a frequency that civilian pilots can't hear? Wouldn't requiring VHF for those communications give civilian pilots the situational awareness needed to help prevent collision? Yes, absolutely. When I was flying my military aircraft, we had UHF and we had VHF. But I can tell you, when we were at a civilian airport, I always, always, always talked on VHF, never on UHF. Even if I was given a UHF frequency, I would ask them for a VHF frequency. So just because you can do something doesn't mean you should. And we've been talking on this channel a lot about the experience gap that's been growing in pilots because older pilots are being forced out at age 65 and the younger pilots are coming along. They're good pilots, but they just don't have the experience. Experience tells you if you've got UHF or VHF and you're in, in crowded airspace near an airport, you always, always, always talk on VHF so that the other airliners can hear what you're saying it's the safest thing to do. All right, at uh, Captain Gino, uh, as an airline captain, I know that an experienced controller would have told the CRJ that another aircraft was maintaining visual separation on him, giving him the chance to go around. Uh, is it fair to say the CRJ crew was not given the information they needed to make their own safety decisions? There was a lot of stuff that wasn't done that night at DCA. And one of them was the air traffic controller was, as you can tell from listening to the ATC, a bit stretched. That's a nice way to put it. Overwhelmed. There's a bigger picture issue with that. The air traffic controllers up in New York, we, we talk about them. We make fun of them all the time because they're large and in charge and they're almost kind of rude on the radio, but they control their airspace. Nobody else does it for them. And so when you go up to New York, you know who's in charge. And when the ATC tells you what to do, you do it up there. And if you can't do it, then you simply say to them, unable. But down in DC, it was a little different case that night. She was trying to be accommodating. She said, you know, do you have the traffic? Yep. Do you have the traffic? A third time, do you have the traffic? Yep. 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 Okay. Are you going to go around the traffic? At that point, she's watching them get closer and closer on the screen. As they get too close, you don't say, are you going to go behind? You simply say, helicopter, turn left, helicopter, stop, helicopter, do whatever. Or you tell the RJ, go around, you take charge of it so that they don't, because it could be very likely that the helicopter had the wrong aircraft in sight. Passing behind an aircraft down here, as opposed to the aircraft right there, could cause a disaster, and it did. All right, we've got uh, at Nerf Talk 1163, a helicopter can hover in place, but a plane cannot. That's a good observation. Yes, that's true. 
Why didn't the helicopter pilots simply stop and wait for the airliner to safely pass? My my theory is they had the wrong aircraft in sight. I think they did have traffic in sight. It wasn't the traffic that they ran into. Nobody would intentionally fly into another aircraft. Um, I think they were looking beyond it. They never saw the one in front of them. And that's where the this happened. But yeah, you're right. They should have stopped. Uh, but hindsight's always 2020. All right, final one for today. At D Boy Ete 42. After the accident, the helicopter route was reportedly closed or changed. Does making a safety change after a tragedy uh, implicitly mean the previous procedure was unsafe all along? Well, you got to do something. You got to make a change, right? And the um, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, hoping for a different outcome. So once you realize that, yep, this isn't working, I think it was the right thing absolutely to shut down that route and reroute the aircraft. My understanding is all the helicopter routes now have been rerouted in a different way to get them out of DC, not through the traffic pattern, which again, why didn't we see that in the first place? But a problem's not a problem until it's a problem, sadly. And uh, it's a shame that this one had to be um, spelled out in blood. But um, I can tell you that that, uh, aviation is the most uh, transparent culture, corporate culture out there on the planet. We really do try to be uh, revealing. We try to uh, point out problems and pass those problems along and change the system. But even with that being said, something like this could happen. And it did. But we're making the right moves in the right direction. These are great questions, folks. Thank you for that. Uh, I hope it reassures you a little bit about what happened up there in DCA and the fact that I think that was a one in a billion accident. I don't think anything like that's going to happen again anytime soon. And hopefully, prayerfully, and with a call from you to Congress about the Rotor Act, this will never happen again. Well, it was a great episode of Ask the Captain. Keep those questions coming because on the next episode, you might make it onto my little screen and you'll be the next person that gets an answer on Ask the Captain.